So what do I think will be fast? Um, okay, let's do C++ PyTree first. Um, Richard, what, what did you want to get more info on? Um, sorry, I just want to check. Is Nikita here? No. So I guess we're killing this topic. Um, we can still talk about it. I'd probably get started. And uh, I think like from yesterday's meeting, I think where we left off is the inter op. I think there's a meeting the in person. Inter op, uh, like a uh, parallel data. And uh, uh, which we want to. Oh, Michael, so you need a mute. I don't know, Eliza, oh. like the... Okay, so, so if Nikita's not here, like, like Alvin's here. So Alvin can still tell us about concerns. Uh, yeah, I think the, there were, there are, there is an ongoing discussion of like C++ by trees. Uh, I think the big difference is that Horus now has concrete uh, reasons and uh, showing that it actually matters for perf, or at least it gives a significant boost. Uh, I'm not sure if we could do even better with other strategies, but this one at least helps. Uh, the bigger concern that remains from before are discussion between uh, uh, consistency with the Python, Py3, we have today in core, uh, making sure they actually do the same thing, and also the whole dependency and packaging question of, right now it's a soft dependency. Uh, it's and not clear where we want to go there. And uh, yesterday there was some discussion about what is public APIs, but basically the whole thing was moved to be private, so now it's a big chunk of more private code. So is that still something we're happy with going forward as well? Okay, um, Albin, everything you said seems like the like status quo. So I mean, I mean, I'm having to close this as a update, but like, is there something new we want to resolve here? The main new thing that changed the status quo is that the. PR adding PyTree as a self dependency. This uh, a independent C package that provides a C PyTree as a dependency was merged, and so now we are in we we have one, but none of the questions have been strongly answered. So we move forward without actually resolving the status quo. Like, I, I think the, the status quo thing that will probably happen is we will, like, make it private. Uh, we'll probably move it as a sub-module, it, it would be my guess. Uh, and then we mainly just start using it internally as part of, like, the compilation process. Uh, there's a separate discussion to be had, I, I think, about, like, uh, making it as, like, a user-facing API. And here, like, the questions about unification with Python PyTree are harder to answer. Um, but I, I'm not sure we need to answer those questions now. Okay, Richard, are you satisfied? I'm satisfied. Okay, sounds good. Moving on. Okay, you went, um, got a bunch of votes. Uh, let me check if, okay, Ivan is here. And uh, Ivan, do you want to present for you went? Uh, I, I can say more about that's a feature request, yes. And yeah, I'll use give us the basic idea. motivation and like what some basic parameters you want out of the feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Torture Conference modules use FBGM TBs, uh, table batch embedding that started using uh, four bit uh, quantization in production. And uh, FBGM represents embedding weights with uint eight uh, for all quantized types for uh, two, three, four bit. And in Torture modules, uh, we cannot write uh, the type agnostic code uh, due to that, and uh, having two, three, four bit uh, coin, uh, uin two, three, four storage types tensors will help to express the logic uh, without any multipliers, uh, inferencing the number of columns because uh, it will allow to just to use tensor shapes as a real number of embeddings columns. Uh, mostly, we don't pretend to use express calculation logic, so it's all in a gem. 
Uh, so it's more about expressing state dict and doing sharding. So what uh, the minimal requirement from our side is more about uh, to support uint dot two uh, d type uint two three four and to do view to do the sharding. So when we split by columns and uh, uh, rows, so it can be not element wise. So it's more about storage type. And uh, regarding uh, the problem that pointers are all uh can point only to byte so there is no byte plus four bit pointers yeah so it's i i think it's totally fine so it's just as an idea uh to restrict uh, number of the last dimension that it should be uh by modulus two for eight for example for un4 uh we can create only even dimensions on the last dimension that's why and to restrict all the views uh, not to have any sub byte uh, problems okay do we have questions comments uh let me let me give a little bit of comparison so uh you might ask what about the q uint 8 uh for x2 and similar d types we already have in core so those quantized d types specify a quantization scheme but torchrec does not want to use the same quantization scheme that say Q tensor were using. So they have their own scheme and really they don't really want semantic meaning. They just want to, you know, know that it's packed in some way. Um, two, it has to be packed. So, uh, you know, you can't just do a UN8 storing only uh, three bits in the UN8 because that will be bad for storage. Um, and, uh, the, um, the user request is that, um, we actually like, if you have, eight uint4 elements, you actually want the size to be eight, not for example, four, which is how you would do it if it was uint4x2, which means every item is actually two uint4s. So the UX preference is that you actually can talk about these individually. Um, Supriya. Uh, yeah, does this have to be in core? Can, can something like this be supported out of core? Uh, I just like to know what will like, have Ivan's thoughts on that mm, so our, our main goal will be so it's if the gem returns uh, tensor so it's just a torch tensor in uint 8 and the idea is to change what they return as an embedding weight that we express in stadium uh, so that will be the next step how to convince uh, a not to use something out of the core and probably yeah so I think it can be some Jerry suggested subclass for example so that will be totally fine subclass of tensor that will match the types and will return proper shape and uh, d-type Tris I was gonna say that I think, I think tensor subclass seems like a useful extension point um I'd be curious if it doesn't if there's reasons why that wouldn't work what Horace uh, so this is like vaguely related to uh, like the stuff I, I was thinking about as well. Um, and I, I feel like it is difficult to put these in the core for a couple different reasons. Uh, one is I'm not even sure like <laughs> uh, how you would do like a UN3 type. Like, you know, what is it like a UN3 packed to eight? Like, or yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's not super clear. Um, and, and then the other thing is like, you know, I, I think looking forward, you know, that like, uh, like, you know, in three and four aren't, aren't even the only plausible, you know, D types we might have, uh, you know, there are other also kind of like packed D types, for example, that people are interested in, uh, where like the scales and the offsets are kind of like packed into the tensor, um, and, and, and things like this. And so I, I feel like, uh, in general, um, embedding quantization formats into core is like not the right, uh, path. And I, I think tensor subclasses are like a reasonable way uh, for it. Uh, before uh, Jerry goes, I just want to clarify. Um, the ask here is not for a quantization type. It is simply to support sub bit byte size unsigned integers in core. So for example, if you were like embedding scale and offsets in a tensor, um, as long as you don't have some non-uniform byte size thing going on, uh, this would still work like you know you would you would you would have your un threes packed and then you could change the meaning of them so like yes i agree quantization schemes change a lot but like there is only one three bit uint type 
like there aren't going to be any more. You do one for each sub byte size and then you're done. Jerry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just wanted to check uh, because previously we added the like all these bits types, like bits a bit bits four by two. Um, and these are kind of in uninterpreted meaning, right? Um, just wondering, uh, can we reuse that or are we going to add new things? Yeah, let me answer that. So um, my general, uh, so I was one of the people who advocated strongly for um, having it as a bits concept and I have changed my mind. So there are two reasons, there are a few reasons I've changed my mind. So one is that um, I think uh, representing these types as unsigned integers is more useful because it allows you to like get a bunch of like basic operations to find on them. Whereas bits, you literally cannot do anything, right? So like a uint, you can like do bit masking and things like that. And you can actually build out your quantization steam on top of that. So if I could go back in time, I would rename all of our bits types to just be uint types. Like um, maybe we can still do that. The second distinction is um, we, when we added the sub byte size bits support, uh, we did this in the same way qint 4x2 was implemented. Well, actually, I don't even remember if we actually did this. Yeah, which is that they're, they're vectored. So you only get one, two, and four, and it's one by eight, two by four, four by two. So this violates the ux request, which is that it's not, uh, that they don't want them to be vectored. Wait, Tim so just, just quickly respond like the, but that is uninterpreted, right? It's like, it can just mean uh, it's stored in this way and logically it can do something different. Uh, yes. So, so like, you know, we could like be like, okay, well, let's also add, um, for example, a uint four so that then you interpret the four bit quantity as an unsigned integer and probably for uh um fb gem because they don't need any operations bits will work fine the bigger problem is that the bits types are vectored and um uh they don't want that okay what do you mean what Oh, Horace, did you want to follow up on that? Then you can go ahead. Yeah, you go. I, I was just like, what, what do you mean a uh, FPGM doesn't want the vector? I, I think you said so, something so about vector. So let's yeah. concretely, so bits four by two, right? So let's say I have a mm -hmm. one element tensor of D type bits four by two. So the size is one and I have one element consisting of two four bit integers packed together. So for example, yeah, if I yeah. call item on this, I should get a tuple of two yeah, yeah. two and four uh, scalars, right? But yeah. Ivan doesn't want that. He wants, if I have two U and four tensors, I want the size to be two. That seems like the Yeah, logical. okay, I see. That's what you mean, okay. Uh, and any special, any reason why U in, just U int versus int and U int, if you ever were to do this? Uh, the reason to do it, U int rather than int is because um, a lot more like bitwise operations are defined on unsigned integers. I mean, you probably want int as well, probably, exactly. yeah, yeah, but yeah. like um, you can, it's easier to build signed operations out of unsigned rep than vice versa. Well, my, my concern would be that if, if it's like an introduce as a, a first class storage type, then we, you probably also want it to be expressible for uh, quantization using the int four type because I, I know that you know there are places where int four weight quantization is also happening in some of the use cases I've seen, but they can't express it, so they yeah, do. So, it so I, I would I would say that in general it seems useful to have both int and uint, yeah. and the reason we haven't done it is mostly because you have to do the ops and the ops are you know, you need a lot of ops, so that's kind of a pain. Horus. Uh, I'm just gonna ask, like, how, how feasible is this to actually do? I don't know. Um, I, I, I spent a little time thinking about it and like the, the divisibility constraint seems pretty important. 
but like it's just it's just a pain like you're gonna have a bunch of places in core where it's like you know what's the size of this thing well i will give you the number of bytes it is and then this doesn't work if you have a sub byte type so i like you like the way that i would go about doing this is i would like be like okay let me define this d type and then try to get like construction working and then like fix all the places i need to in order to make this actually work out so yes so if we're not going the subclass route this would be a pretty invasive core change um, because you would basically be whack a mole all the places where we assume byte addressing is okay until you're done. You can do the subclassing in C as well, right? So you can, if you have an op, you can actually check the concrete type of the tensor and say whether oh, this tensor is actually a subclass implementation of, I don't know, some other tensor, or is just a Python concept. If we're going to do it in C++, I would prefer to do it directly in core. I think it will be simpler that way. You may not have enough extension points in C++ to actually oh. implement it. Okay, so out, otherwise it will be just in Python. Yeah, because in Python, you can just like lie about what the shape is. <laughs> and you yeah. know, all that stuff. Right, right. Okay, any other questions? Oh, yeah, Supriya. Yeah, so if you are thinking about adding this to core, what a, what do we feel about like operator support? Like I think FBGEM has some use case where they're gonna use it, but what about other operators? Like if more people come and say, hey, we want to have like three bits or four bits work on these operators, are we then going to support them or ask them to add their own extensions? How would that work? So this is the overall um, question, which is, you know, if we want to add new D types and we don't want to bloat our CUDA binary size by adding extension to everything, what are they? And I think the, the current stance is that uh, we're happy, we, we will add D types with no operator support. And then if you want operator support, you have to go through PyTorch 2 compilation or some similar just in time thing like I, I guess you could do well, jitterator. I, I, I think adding ops for, for these new D types would not be that hard, I think. Like, no, the problem the, the, is binary size. Like, especially if we're going to do every single sub binary. No, no, I, I mean, like, I, I think you can do it without bloating the binary size. Be, like, because I think in general for these ops, like, the ops you want to do, do on them are either classified into, like, uh, ops that are, like, directly taking them in, uh, in, in which case, like, we don't need, like, you know, special PyTorch core support for them. Uh, and like ops that are purely for utility purposes, like you know, uh, like quantizing and everything like that. And for the, uh, the utility purposes, like those can be implemented just by like you know slicing the bits or something like that. And I, I feel like you can do this uh, like uh, without new CUDA kernels. You, you just kind of like extract out the appropriate bits, um, and, and then like r run the operations. And, and then repack it. Actually, I I don't think I can quite agree to that because it, it depends like let's say if you introduce in four type and you have multiple operation then how do you what is the numerical uh, like how how are you doing the accumulation uh, i'm not talking about for mammals i'm talking about for like generic uh, utility things but as soon as you introduce a type in you know, as a basic type a storage type for tensor all of that are applicable right all the ops become like you know fair game uh, well, I, I, except I don't Horace's that's... claim that there is a limited subset of utility operations that you might want to do. And I would agree that um, if you only implement those, um, the binary size increase is not too big. I don't think this was Supriya's question, though. I think Supriya's question was, you know, there are a lot of operators in Py PyTorch, and people will naturally ask, like, can I have int for indexing? Yep. Yep. Can I have int exactly. for, you know, all that stuff? And then that will be a, that will be a problem. And I don't, I don't think you can do this in low binary size. Or I, I, I just, I don't really think there's a problem because I just don't think you're gonna pass, be passing like U and four D types into like layer norm. <laughs> uh, like I, I feel like in practice, the set of like operators that you want these quantized D types for is restricted to like mammals, convolutions, uh, embedding bag, 
uh, like attention, and, and that's pretty much it. And, and even that, it's mostly on the wings, right? Yeah. So if well, that's the case, why does it need to have like a you know, uh, separate D type? Is it, can it not be a custom type that is only like you know for? Uh, I mean, I don't know how exactly to express that in general, but would that not be an option? I think that's the idea of having using like a tensor subclass. But in C plus plus, that's that's hard. And then uh, Ed is saying that if you're trying to do this in C plus plus, you probably will do. Or sorry, I I don't understand why this has to be in C plus plus. No, no, no. It, it it can be Python. So because yeah, so we can. Do well, I mean, for, for full export, where you want to be able to express this and export a model uh, with four bit weights, which can be executed in a different backend, it's only in C plus plus. You would want to express that, right? But I think uh, it will get desegregated into regular ops by then. I I I think if you want I to export it, it's not like you know edge devices want to be taking yeah three x eight D types uh, natively. Uh, no, they do. I mean, well, uh, so uh, we what we can alternatively do is like if it's only expressed in Python, then you have to re replace them with a custom ops that uh, understand that what is a D type on those. Otherwise. Otherwise, they also need the same support at in runtime on that side, right? Unless you unless you replace the ops which have like a you know, four bit weights into linear with a custom op, which is you know understands that it is actually taking a four bit tensor for weight. Yeah, if you go the subclass route, you will have to use custom ops, but. Yeah. As as uh, Horace was saying, you know, we already have custom ops for these things because they usually are are not always like you know, for for FP eight, we cannot use the current Matmo API. We need a right. special one we scale and stuff. So it's already custom ops. Yeah, I think that might be fine. Yeah. Any more questions, comments? Obviously, there's a staffing question for this, aka there is no staff, Ivan. But um, uh, at least um, I would I would agree that um, the tensor subclass in Python approach is doable, like out of core without like needing someone to actually know how the C plus plus internals in PyTorch work. Um, so my main consideration there would be is if there's a perf problem, but probably not question mark. I don't know. So th those are some details that you're going to have to figure out. Mm. Yeah, for general logic, uh, I think, uh, yeah, so embedding logic uh, in Torchirek Python modules for the state dict, it doesn't go to the runtime. So it can be, it's more about just logical representation and uh, correctness. Uh, for C++, it's more about how runtime currently works. And will it be the problem, for example, to export that uh, how the dot shape will be resolved. For example, we express in the Python the dot shape it's uh, yeah. so, two so by two. I, I think I yeah. think prototyping the desired UI with a Python subclass is the like most feasible thing to do, absent someone on core actually like cracking the whip on C++. And you can still use this if we do change our mind and say, okay, we do want to do it in C++, the Python prototype can serve as a spec for what exactly the C++ behavior should be. Jerry? Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. So like um, the in for, does it imp about implementation, like in for uh, subclass, tensor subclass is going to, uh, is it going to be backed up by like int8? Yeah, it would be storage backed by int8 storage. Or and... bit state storage if you like. And like one one byte is representing one uh you in for or like no, it's they're packed. packed. They would be packed. Or sorry, I actually want to note another issue here. Like one one another issue is that like different backends actually have different requests in terms of how exactly they're packed. For example, a Apple uh, told us they specifically want it packed into a uh int sixteen type, uh, because they have special hardware instructions for in sixteen and, and they do not want it packed into an int eight. Um, so it, it, this is kind of like a, another variable uh, on the dimension. <laughs> okay, okay. Can you say more on that? What, uh, what it means, like meaning in 16 minutes, you want to pack 
is is a four bit data we want to actually pack four values into 16 bits is that what it means yeah right. yes yeah, so, let, so let me just ask the question like how about like uh in three what is it backed up like still an empty tensor Wait no wait no well, no no <laughs> or or whatever the packing whatever the alignment requirement that um the backend has is what the backing would be. So, uh, wait so in three is like, um, if it's backed up by like. If it's uh, backed by eight. an int eight, then your uh, divisibility requirement is you must be multiples of eight like three by eight but we don't have this right it has to be multiples of 24 right but wait but we don't have three by eight are we going to like add a three by eight well if you're doing uh, the subclass you don't have to right when then wait the, what is the storage d type then the storage d type is just an int eight and okay, and then one int eight is going to represent one in three. No, 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 no. It'll represent three and eight in... represent eight in threes. Oh. Okay, <laughs> I see. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Kimish. Uh, so, so uh, what uh, if you look at uh, the uh, sub uh, tensor subclassing? When you export a model, would you be like the it would. The, when I inspect nodes, uh, let's say parameter nodes, and get the value out of it, would I still be able, able to say that, okay, that is actually a subclass of whatever, 4-bit or 3-bit so tensor? Brian's work on subclassing would say that the subclass completely just sugars away by the time you do a post-AOT export. So you would have a pile of int8 tensors, and you would not necessarily know that they used to be three is this would be fine for your oh. custom ops because your custom ops would like you know just want in date tensors right and they they just know that it's uh, actually no no so i i if 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 i want if i were if i had less a special linear that took a four bit uh weights and i use a python uh subclass like tensor subclassing how would i on the exported graph can i uh reason somehow that okay that linear is actually taking your Four bit tensor and replace that with a custom op. I mean, your but your linear it has to be a custom op anyway, because there's no such thing as the <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah, 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 that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Or that's true. so, so yeah, the, yeah. the other possibility here yeah. for representation for export purposes uh, would be the thing I mentioned in my doc uh, about like the dequantized op, yeah. uh, uh, which which would uh, allow you to kind of preserve like the uh, FP sixteen mm. Uh, during tracing, uh, and then pattern match it at, at a later point. All right, that makes sense. Actually, let's pivot to Horace's doc for a moment. Uh, you didn't have that many votes, but Horace, do you want to just briefly tell us what's up with the doc? Share your screen, maybe. Uh, sure. Uh, the, the 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 general like overall proposal is basically. Or I also to be clear, I changed my mind about precisely what I want from this <laughs> after I wrote the doc, but I think it might still be a good idea. So the general idea here is like, or so there's just kind of I gave like a brief overview of quantization formats, and so part of the issue is that there are many different types of quantization formats that people want, including like in four quantization, and so for example, if you want to write that in basic Python, uh, this is like the pattern that we pattern match today in order to uh, like, you know, match it to the in for MM in inductor. Uh, and, you know, I, I think in general, like long patterns are very brittle. Um, and I, I think it'd be quite difficult to like get this pattern to match without knowing exactly uh, what, what you're trying to pattern match. Uh, and then there's other things like in three in five quantization. Then there's other things like grouped uh, quantization. Uh, there's things like uh, pack quantization formats where like you have uh, you know, like 12 four-bit values followed by like a nine-bit scale or something like that. And so uh, the general issue here basically is that um, if you want to pattern match into a fused dequantize plus like other op uh, at a later point, um, then it's very difficult to do so when the dequant is written like arbitrarily. 
uh, you know, as in like this case, like this isn't even Pullman's operators. You notice that there's actually a concat here <laughs> uh, but between these uh, two different values. And so basically the general idea here about like my proposal for how to resolve this issue is we provide like a very generic like a10 dot dequantize uh, operator where the idea here is that it takes in like a tensor and then it takes in like, you know, maybe like a D type uh, or like or basically overall it takes in like a scheme string. Uh, where the idea is that like the scheme string allows you to introduce an arbitrary dequantization routine. So for example, you know, you can imagine if you say that the scheme is a row and D type is int eight, then the input is like n n and the output is also uh is, is like int eight uh, n by n and the output is fp16 n by n. But on the other hand, if you choose like int four and like group 128, then your input might be n comma n divided by four and your output is fp16 uh, n by n. Um, so that, that's kind of like the general proposal here. And the one reason this proposal is a little bit weird, uh, and I guess the reason I wrote this document in the first place, is that uh, this is a little bit more like a uh, Siski op, uh, so to speak. <laughs> like the purpose of this op is to be like a high level, like have some high level semantic meaning so that it is easy to compile the performance down uh, at a later point, either in export or in the compiler. Any questions? The, the long uh, pattern matching, like there, there are easier APIs than that, and like exactly. we wouldn't necessarily yeah, expect a, people. One of our topics is an easier API for dealing with the long pattern. So I'm hoping well. Th there's like the the sp specific way this is written, and then there's another issue, which is just like, uh, long patterns are just like not easy in general to like make work. Like you can you can look at like you know our uh, SDPA patterns. Where we have like uh, I don't know how many we have. Uh, I don't even know where this is. Tension. Whatever. Uh, or, uh, uh, oh, a lot. A lot of notes aren't But like, like just to match something like you know scaled object attention, we have something like you know fifteen different patterns, uh, to try and match the different cases where uh, people are written. The ge the general issue with long patterns is not that they are impossible to write, uh, although that's like one issue. The other issue is just that they are very brittle, uh, and hard to like make work. For example, you can imagine that. Maybe we have like an optimization on concat that lifts it, uh, you know, uh, relative to another op, and like now, oops, all of a sudden, you know, this pattern no longer matches. Chris, um, yeah, yeah, I, I remember like speaking. Horace showed this earlier to me, and my first thought was like, okay, I'm Microsoft. I have this new crazy format. Um, how would I add this? Um, and it seems like this dequan op is particularly a signal for the compiler to say like, Hey, this is a, this is a pattern. I know how to handle this pattern. Um, and I did bring up record function, but it'd be cool if there was like an easy way to wrap patterns that could send that information like in a unit down to inductor. Um, so that inductor can have an easier job pattern matching. Um, and like that is reasonable in general, like, uh, like, and I, I think this is like, you know, part of like the purpose of things like higher order ops. Uh, like for example, like the, you know, SDBA templated, uh, like templated SDPA. Um, but in this case, I think it's kind of difficult simply because their quantization schemes are like very varied. Uh, so it, it's not super clear to me what is like the single, like uh, how to like parameterize uh, this so you, you can uh, like express all, all the different quantization schemes you want. Um, Supriya? Yeah, um, can, you, can you explain to me a little bit how the tensor subclass method would solve the complicated pattern problem? Because depending on where you decide to do pattern match, like the tensor subclass might just get de-sugared into this complicated pattern and then you have to do the same thing again, right? Right, so, so th this is maybe about like how, wh why, I, where such why I changed my mind. Um, so the original thing you know, is I, I thought it'd be just, you know, best to just like write this in the user code. Uh, and then like, you know, pattern match on that. Um, but I, I think it, it's actually better to have the tensor subclass in many cases can like directly uh, match it to the appropriate operator. Um, so for example, like, uh, like, you know, essentially the issue here is you want to convert like a 10 dot dequant in four plus matmol into like, you know, in four weight only matmol implementation, wh wherever that is. 
And so uh, one, one way to do that is to completely recover it through pattern matching the compiler. Another way to do it is to just like handle in the tensor subclass. So basically you never see a explicit dequantize operator. You just like, whenever you process the MM, you just immediately dispatch to like the fused uh, dequant plus uh, MM operator. But in the case that uh, we do not have such an operator, uh, it, it may still be like desirable to ha have an operator like this, uh, just to kind of like be able to pattern match uh, further down the line. Jessel? Just a, just oh, a quick ahead. follow up to that, sorry. Uh, so when you say pattern match at a higher level, you mean like at the dynamo level, you just, when you see like a tensor subclass feeding into some kind of a MM op, you oh, just- no, no. The, the tensor subclass would do the matching itself uh, when it traces. So like the, the code looks something like, uh, uh, like, you know, torque dispatch, uh, if func equals a 10 dot MM, you know, return like a 10 dot weight in four weight only MM or something like that. Okay. Jensel. Yeah. So, so I guess, I guess one of the motivations that you, you claimed was that it would make stuff easier to pattern match in inductor and. I'm wondering, like, I feel like inductor needs to know about every single quantization scheme. Cause like the, the, one of the problems with this is that like, suppose we add a new quantization scheme and we don't add it to inductor. Like in some sense, I don't want inductor to pattern match that. Cause like, it, like, like what, like, suppose you get, you match like unknown quantization scheme plus MM, like, like, I'm not sure what you actually do with that. Uh, oh, I mean, so, so in that case, like most likely like how this would look like an inductor is like in the, um, the pattern matching happens before the lowering. And then in the case that it does not match into a pattern, the lowering would just lower it into the appropriate, um, the, the appropriate like decomposition. Uh, so so the, the idea here behind the ATINT is like, there would be like a reference uh, implementation of this uh, in Python, uh, which can be, uh, you know, potentially arbitrarily uh, slow and inefficient. So for example, you know, in, in this case, we could just pattern match this dequantize scheme uh, into like a, a separate, into, you know, inductor IR. Uh, in the case that a pattern does not already uh, turn it into an explicitly fused op. Um, I see. So, you, so you'd have Python references that we could then use to, to yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so that that would allow this to run in eager uh, as well. Although you know, or like you know, on other hardware, albeit perhaps not not as efficiently. Brian. Um. Are so are the subclass versus like explicit dequant op approach, like are they independent? Because I could imagine a subclass that desugars into like my fused in format mob, or I could imagine a subclass that decomposes into like um, a dequant op plus a mammal. And then in theory, inductor could pattern match with either. And then maybe that's just a question of like, do we want to add a million fused ops or do we want just one dedicated dequant op? And then I guess the subclass there is really just kind of like UX syntactic sugar over the user adding a dequant op in their yeah. code. So that's a good question. Um, I think this is a little bit dependent on like what the future of these kernels looks like um, and, and like wh where we want to put them. So nowadays, like usually when we have kernels like this, we typically put them into native functions on YAML. Um, and then, you know, and Dr. just kind of treats it as a fallback kernel. Uh, but you could imagine that in the future, instead of kind of, you know, uh, pre-compiling each one of these, uh, perhaps a doctor is responsible for like instantiating the CUDA kernel and doing the compilation. Um, in, in which case, uh, or actually, sorry, another thing related to you is just like, you know, do you want this to work in eager mode or do you, do you want it to rely on like inductor for the pattern matching? Uh, and so in general, like, I think my feeling is that it would be nice to kind of have it pattern match, uh, during like in, in eager mode as well. Uh, although I'm I'm not super sure uh, about this point Be because like if you pattern match in eager mode, then you're now either forced to put it into native function on YAML, or we can figure out a way to have inductor like compile that specific op, or or something like that uh, into a single lowering thing. Um, but perhaps if we just had a way of converting a inductor like lowered buffer into an op. Uh, that that can be processed by like uh, a a ten or the dispatcher, uh, maybe that'd be sufficient. 
Okay. Any more? I think just uh, Go ahead. yeah. One other thing I want to add is uh, when you say like you know talking about inductor, you're mostly talking about like server use cases, like like server GPU or CPU. But I think this might also be applicable for edge. I guess not happening right now, but probably very soon. From what I've heard, uh, like they'll want to run LLMs on device, and we'll definitely need like two, three, four bit quantization for that. In which case, we have to like figure out the path through torch export and execute torch as well. Yeah, so so th this might be a good idea, uh, like just uh, as well for like uh, edge export because this allows you to like preserve this semantic information uh, through the like the export process. Uh, and the different lowering processes, so that you know the backends can uh, pattern match this at, at at a later point. Jerry, yeah, just a quick question: like, does, does this have to be uh, native, uh, like, uh, like, like in, in the C plus plus, or can we just implement this in the in Python, like uh, use like some custom mouse? Uh, you, you can probably implement it. Uh, well. Yes, I, I, I'm going to stick my neck out and say yes. All right, I guess I'm not actually totally sure why we ever implement anything as a native function on YAML as opposed to... Uh... <laughs> For performance. But since you're proposing we do tensor subclass, you've already lost all your performance, so whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do, do, do you have any like ops that are registered? I, I guess we do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so right now the export API, the export pass already has some QDQ functions registered in uh, Python, like in some custom libraries. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I. 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 I don't see any nominal reason why why it can't be uh, like done in Python. Uh, I guess mostly just concerned about uh, like dependency issues uh, when exporting. Okay, I'm going to move us on to the last quantization related right. topic. Sorry. Go I, I guess brief question. Then are people in favor of this proposal overall? <laughs> like, uh, do, like, uh, do people? Does anybody have like particular concerns uh, about adding like an op like this? So one uh, implementation concern is if you want an open registration quantization scheme. Um, that that's going to take a little designing. Well, we don't really do that kind of thing in ops right now. I see. Yeah, I feel this can be added by need, and also we need to think about like what kind of things like schemes we yeah, need like, to. Yeah, you can also on. just have a separate quantize op per scheme. Like, there's no reason they all have to be one, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, uh... I mean, I think the the like having open registration is nice. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it is true you can have a separate one per scheme. Although the, I I just feel like that's a bit weirder. So the problem is like um, different scheme might require different arguments, right? Uh, that is true. Um, yeah, I, I guess having a separate opera scheme is not the worst thing in the world. Mm. Okay, let's talk about pattern matching. Okay, Jerry, do you want to present or do you want me to present? Because I, I, it is kind of my proposal. Yeah, sure, please go ahead. Okay, I'll go ahead and present. So, um, do, 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 just a sec. Okay, so what's the, um, so we're still talking about quantization and specifically we're talking about um, uh, the problem in quantization where we have a bunch of external backends who want to write these so-called quantizer patterns where the general recipe is they're looking for some sequence of nodes in the graph and they're going to replace it with some quantized representation, right? Like, you know, say you've got a comp, batch norm, whatever. You want to match that and do that. And so I was talking to Jerry about like, you know, them using pre-dispatch A10IR. And one thing Jerry was concerned about was like, hey, like the pre-dispatch A10IR, like the only way people are really going to be able to write this is by just like dumping out the IR and then like copy pasting the what they see into the patterns they want to match. And then if we change any of the logic. Um, you know, that is between the Python API, the Torch IR API, 
and the actual dispatcher calls uh, to move things around, then all those patterns will break because you know they'll be matching against some specific way of desugaring to predispatch. Whereas um, you know uh, that's something that normally in eager mode we're allowed to change, subject to FC constraints for you know deployment. So um, so I was like, okay, well, why don't we take a page from the pattern matcher and inductor, and we should just have an API that lets people write their patterns in Torch IR and have them desugar to predispatch A10 IR. And those of you who are familiar with the inductor pattern matcher will know that this is exactly the same idea, except that instead of predispatch A10 IR, inductor is taking it to post dispatch joint graph. IR to match on the joint graphs. So concretely, what do you do? So you write your pattern in terms of um, you know a bunch of PyTorch operations that you want to do. You need some example sizes so that you can trace through the pattern. You trace the pattern, getting you a sequence of ATEN ops, and then that sequence of ATEN ops is what you actually match against uh, when you when you uh, like actually do the pattern match. Um, there are a few things that um, uh, are needed for the um, quantization use case. So one thing is that um, in quantization, so okay, so in regular um, inductor pattern matches, there's just a replacement that we want to do in this case. But for quantization, typically the replacement is not just a straight replace this sequence of ops with this sequence of ops, but instead, you know, do some side effects, keep track of you know, what you're quantizing, make some updates to some quantization configs that are going on. And in general, like it's in the context of a much more general graph transformation that isn't just straight replacements. So uh, I was like, okay, I don't really understand how this works, but let's just give a very, very general API. So the, the most general API I can think of is uh, we generalize the concept of replacement with a replacement handler. And what you get with a replacement handler is you get a bunch of FX nodes for all the things you managed to match, right? So you matched the sequence of ATEN ops, you get the FX nodes corresponding to each of the operators. And you can also, and this was a requirement Jerry conveyed to me, you can have intermediates inside your pattern that you also get the FX nodes for. Jerry, button. Yeah, just, just to clarify, like we, we don't need the handler, I think we just need uh, the matcher that can give us enough uh, access or information about um, different nodes in, in the matched graph. Oh yeah, sorry. So another way you can structure this is you have a matcher and the matcher just gives you a bunch of FX nodes when it successfully matches. And then you can do whatever yeah. you want with those yeah. nodes. And that's, that's the proposal. So um, taking it back to the... Uh, the um, you know problem statement, right? So if you write your matches in terms of torch IR, if the torch IR decomp changes, um, that's fine because your pattern will change automatically as you go. And uh, the thinking is these will be much more pleasant to write than having to just write the decompiled ATEN operation instead. Questions, comments? Yes, Chris. Mm, would this make have made the SCPA pattern matcher easier if this existed? Uh, I think the answer is no, because uh, the the problem with the SDPA pattern matcher is you legitimately are matching against different operations every time. Oh, so I assume when you say SDPA was hard, is because you have so many different patterns, right? So yeah. no, I, I don't actually think this really helps you a lot. Ars? Um, perhaps this is more detailed than we have time to get into, but wh why exactly is this different? Like, I, I, I'm not sure, like, what exactly is a general graph transform that's going on here? Like, and, and why pattern matching the ops ha has to go together with, like, the rest of, of the graph transform? Uh, so here is an example of some logic that uh, for con value. So this is the matching code that's just looking for the nodes in question. And then we don't do a replacement. Instead, there's some get the Q spec for the input things and like, you know, work out what the partition you're going to do is 
and set up some quantization annotations on the nodes. And then there's some other pass that happens afterwards. Uh, is this like trying to preserve some information for a later further downstream another pattern match? Oh, no, this is like um, attach some metadata to the nodes that you matched in the pattern. So that and the subsequent uh, transformations will use these annotations um, to insert observers um, in the graph. I see. Sherlock. In the pattern graph, there is a few special node like context dot mark intermediate in the design doc you should just show um how are we gonna preserve those in the pattern graph like is the tracer gonna recognize those somehow yeah so the 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 tracer has to like keep track because as you desugar right the expectation is that um any uh intermediate will have a node in the pattern as well so you you basically need a way to match like intermediate nodes in the pattern, even though they are, but you're going to re require them not to have outbound edges. So, so they still have to like not be input outputs, but you still yeah. want to be able to identify them. Yeah. I'm just wondering, like, uh, are we assuming like, this is some kind of like dynamo parsing the code and then stick the, this as a, some either node or metadata into the resulting FX oh notes. yeah, I I don't know that that's that's an implementation detail. Yeah, yeah. On, on the implementation side, like like we might just want like a labeling API, uh, just because like the the input that you're getting uh to that like proposed API is not actually going to be the node in the output graph. It's going to be some torch IR like pretrace thing. Um. I think, uh, Ed, I think you, you mentioned before, like we can also return these intermediate uh, nodes in a separate list. That might be easier to implement. It's, it's implementer's choice. Uh, Supriya? Uh, so with this proposal, what is the source of truth for uh, people interacting with quantization, like the users and the backend developers? Is it the Python code of the original model, or is it the IR that is generated after uh, the export step? Yes. So yeah. uh, in this model, what you should be able to do is you should be able to look at the Python model, say, oh, this call and then this call is what I want to match, and then write a pattern like copy pasting that model code in. And we still are doing the actual transform on free dispatch ATEN IR but the pattern should be expressible from the Python code. I see. So is it possible to, I guess it's possible to also do both, right? Because- Yeah, you can also people, just write A10 yeah. things manually. And I expect you would want to for very low level patterns. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one I one torch level IR pattern can be traced into multiple pre-dispatch A10 IR. Are we saying that we're going to just like exhaustively express all the patterns? No, because with, within a specific compiler, you know which IR variant you are. So you want to trace the pattern using the IR variant used in your compiler. I see. And relying on sample input data to exercise that particular variant. Yeah. Okay. Jerry? Uh... Yeah, I think for completeness, we haven't talked about the kind of the use case that uh, people need to rewrite, uh, let me say, match the pattern, rewrite the pattern to another pattern before they can annotate. Uh, yes. Um, so, okay, one other use case is um, uh, let's say you're matching against multi head attention. So with multi-head attention, you don't actually want to match the entirety of multi-head attention. What you want to do is match multi-head attention and then replace it with your own chosen decomposition 
which is probably different than the like standard PyTorch decomposition, and then work with that to do quantization because maybe your decomposition has the right intermediates that you want the observers attached to. So I think this is just a straightforward application of the API as proposed, but it's a it's a two step thing where you match to re decompose and then uh, you know uh, do your thing on the decomposition. Right, and um, if the replacement graph is also generated from Torch, they can then we can have the same guarantee that um, the this replacement is not going to be dependent on the like Python code changes, right? Yeah, although it's much less of a, an issue for the replacement pattern, because let's say that you instead produce a bunch of ATEN ops, like that's gonna stay the same across PyTorch versions. Like it, we, we generally don't remove ATEN ops. Right. The, the reason why changing the decomposition is a problem is because you have a downstream consumer that will see the new IR nodes and won't know what to do. But in the case of you doing the replacement, you actually don't want to use Torch IR, you want to use A10 IR because then you always get the same A10 IR, even if Torch IR changes. Oh. It's a contravariant, oh, yeah. covariant thing going on here. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. That's all for time. Thanks, everyone.